week are all like 15 minutes early, so those I will be on time for. Um, but yes, I am going to go ahead and get started. We are in chapter 22, and I'm just going to jump right in. And again, if you like Anne of Green Gables or you want to check out any other books that I have, um, my books are um, on the link on this video. And I apologize, I left my glasses in the other room, so I'm going to read and hopefully I don't have issues reading because my glasses are in the other room. I don't need them to actually see to read, it just helps, and then since I've been wearing them it makes it a little more difficult. But I'm going to go ahead and get started. Chapter 22, Anne is invited out to tea. And what are your eyes popping out of your head about now? asked Marilla when Anne had just come in from a run to the post office. Have you discovered another kindred spirit? Excitement hung around Anne like a garment shone in her eyes, kindled in every feature. She had come dancing up the lane like a wind-blown sprite through the mellow sunshine and lazy shadows of the August evening. Sorry, I had to turn my light on. No, Marilla, but oh, what do you think? I am invited to tea at the manse tomorrow afternoon. Mrs. Allen left a letter for me at the post office. Just look at it, Marilla. Miss Anne Shirley, Green Gables. That is the first time I was ever called Miss. Such a thrill as it gave me. I shall cherish it forever among my choicest treasures. Mrs. Allen told me she meant to have all the members of her Sunday school class to tea in turn, said Marilla, regarding the wonderful event very coolly. You needn't get in such a fever over it. Do learn to take things calmly, child. For Anne to take things calmly would have been to change her nature, all spirit and fire and dew. As she was, the pleasures and pains of life came to her with troubled intensity. Marilla felt this and was vaguely troubled over it, realizing that the ups and downs of existence would probably bear hardly on this impulsive soul and not sufficiently understanding that the equally great capacity for delight might more than compensate. Therefore, Marilla conceived it to be her duty to drill Anne into, into a tranquil uniformity of disposition as impossible and alien to her as to a dancing sunbeam in one of the brook shallows. She did not make much headway as she sorrowfully admitted to herself. The downfall of some dear hope or plan plunged Anne into deep of, deeps of affliction. The fulfillment thereof exalted her to dizzy realms of delight. Marilla had almost begun to despair of ever fashioning this waif of the world into her model little girl of demure manners and prim deportment. Neither would she have believed that she really liked Anne much better as she was. Anne went to bed that night speechless with misery, because Matthew had said the wind was round northeast and he feared it would be a rainy day tomorrow. The rustle of the poplar leaves about the house worried her. It sounded so like pattering raindrops in the dull, faraway roar of the gulf to which she listened delightfully at other times, loving its strange, sonorous, haunting rhythm, now seemed like a prophecy of storm and disaster to a small maiden who particularly wanted a fine day. Anne thought that the morning would never come. But all things have an end, even nights before the day on which you are invited to take tea at the manse. The morning, in spite of Matthew's predictions, was fine, and Anne's spirits soared to their highest. Oh, Marilla, there is something in me today that makes me just love everybody I see, she exclaimed as she washed the breakfast dishes. You don't know how good I feel. Wouldn't it be nice if, I, if it could last? I believe I could be a model child if I were just invited out to tea every day. But, oh, Marilla, it's a solemn occasion, too. I feel so anxious. What if I shouldn't behave properly? You know I never had tea at a manse before, and I'm not sure that I know all the rules of etiquette, although I've been studying the rules given in the etiquette department of the Family Herald ever since I came here. I'm so afraid I'll do something silly or forget to do something I should do. Would it be good manners to take a second helping of anything if you wanted to be if you wanted to very much? 
The trouble with you, Anne, is that you're thinking too much about yourself. You should just think of Mrs. Allen and what would be nicest and most agreeable for her, said Marilla, hitting for once in her life on a very sound and pithy piece of advice. Anne instantly realized this. You are right, Marilla. I'll try not to think about myself at all. Anne evidently got through her visit without any serious breach of etiquette, for she came home through the twilight under a great high-sprung sky, gloried over with trails of saffron and rosy cloud, in a beatified state of mind, and told Marilla all about it happily, sitting on the big red sandstone slab at the kitchen door with her tired curly head in Marilla's gingham lap. A cool wind was blowing down over the long harvest fields from the rims of furry western hills and whistling through the poplars. One clear star hung above the orchard, and the fireflies were flitting over in Lover's Lane, in and out among the ferns and rustling the boughs. Anne watched them as she talked, and somehow felt that the wind and stars and fireflies were all tangled up together into something unutterably sweet and enchanting. Oh, Marilla! I have had a most fascinating time. I feel that I have not lived in vain, and I shall always feel like that, even if I should never be invited to tea at a manse again. When I got there, Mrs. Allen met me at the door. She was dressed in the sweetest dress of pale pink organdy, with dozens of frills and elbow sleeves, and she looked just like a seraph. I really think I'd like to be a minister's wife when I grow up, Marilla. Minister mightn't mind my red hair, because he wouldn't be thinking of such worldly things. But then, of course, one would have to be naturally good, and I'll never be that, so I suppose there's no use in thinking about it. Some people are naturally good, you know, and others are not. I'm one of the others. Mrs. Lynn says I'm full of original sin. No matter how hard I try to be good, I can never make such a success of it as those who are naturally good. It's a good deal like geometry, I expect. But don't you think that trying so hard ought to count for something? Mrs. Allen is one of those naturally good people. I love her passionately. You know there are some people like Matthew and Mrs. Allen that you can love right off without any trouble, and there are others like Mrs. Lynde that you have to try very hard to love. You know you ought to love them because they know so much and are such active workers in the church, but you have to keep reminding yourself of it all the time or else you forget. There was another little girl at the manse to tea from the White Sands Sunday School. Her name was Loretta Bradley. She was a very nice little girl. Not exactly a kindred spirit, you know, but still very nice. We had an elegant tea, and I think I kept all the rules of etiquette pretty well. After tea, Mrs. Allen played and sang, and she got Loretta and me to sing, too. Mrs. Allen says I have a good voice, and she says I must sing in the Sunday School choir after this. You can't think how I was thrilled at the mere thought. I've longed to sing in the Sunday school choir, as Diana does, but I feared it was an honor I could never aspire to. Loretta had to go home early because there is a big concert in the White Sands Hotel tonight, and her sister is to recite at it. Loretta says that the Americans at the hotel give a concert every fortnight in aid of the Charlottetown Hospital, and they ask lots of the White Sands people to recite. Loretta said she expected to be her asked herself some day. I just gazed at her in awe. After she had gone, Mrs. Allen and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk. I told her everything, about Mrs. Thomas and the twins, and Katie Maurice and Violetta, and coming to Green Gables, and my troubles over geometry. And would you believe it, Marilla? Mrs. Allen told me she was a dunce at geometry, too. You don't know how that encouraged me. Mrs. Lynde came to the manse just before I left, and what do you think, Marilla? The trustees have hired a new teacher, and it's a lady. Her name is Miss Muriel Stacy. Isn't that a romantic name? Mrs. Lynde says they've never had a female teacher in Avonlea before and thinks it is a dangerous in innovation. But I think it will be splendid to have a lady teacher, and I really don't see how I'm going to live through two, the two weeks before school begins. I'm so impatient to see her. Chapter 23 Anne Comes to Grief in an Affair of Honor Anne had to live through more than two weeks as it happened, almost a month having elapsed since the liniment cake ep episode. It was high time for her to get into fresh trouble of some sort. 
Little mistakes such as absent-mindedly emptying a pan of skim milk into a basket of yarn balls in the pantry instead of into the pig's bucket and walking clean over the edge of the log bridge into the brook while wrapped in imaginative reverie, not really being worth counting. A week after the tea at the manse, Diana Berry gave a party. Small and select, she assured Marilla. Just the girls in our class. They had a very good time, and nothing untoward happened until after tea, when they found themselves in the berry garden, a little tired of all their games and ripe for an enticing form of mischief which might present itself. This presently took the form of daring. Daring was the fashionable amusement among the Avonlea small fry just then. It had begun among the boys, but soon spread to the girls, and all the silly things that were done in Avonlea that summer, because the doers thereof were dared to do them, would fill a book by themselves. First of all, Carrie Sloane dared Ruby Gillis to climb to a certain point in the huge old willow tree before the front door, which Ruby Gillis ate the albate in mortal dread of the fat green caterpillars with which said tree was infested, and with the fear of her mother before her eyes, if she should tear her new muslin dress, nimbly did, to the discomfiture of the aforesaid Carrie Sloane. Then Josie Pye dared Jane Andrews to hop on her left leg, around the garden without stopping once or putting her right foot to the ground, which Jane Andrews gamely tried to do, but gave out at the third corner and had to confess herself defeated. Josie's triumph being rather more pronounced than good taste permitted Anne Shirley, permitted Anne Shirley dared her to walk along the top of the board fence which bounded the garden to the east. Now to walk board fences requires more skill and steadiness of head and heel than one might suppose who has never tried it. But Josie Pye, if deficient in some qualities that make for popularity, had at least a natural and inborn gift duly cultivated for walking board fences. Josie walked the berry fence with an airy unconcern which seemed to imply that a little thing like that wasn't worth a dare. Reluctant admiration greeted her exploit for most of the girls for most of the other girls could appreciate it, having suffered many things themselves in their efforts to walk fences. Josie descended from her perch, flushed with victory, and darted a defiant glance at Anne. Anne tossed her red braids. "'I don't think it's a very wonderful thing to walk a little low-board fence,' she said. "'I knew a girl in Marysville who could walk the ridgepole of a roof.' "'I don't believe it,' said Josie flatly. "'I don't believe anybody could walk a ridgepole. You couldn't, anyhow.' "'Couldn't I?' cried Anne rashly. "'Then I dare you to do it,' said Josie defiantly. "'I dare you to climb up there and walk the ridgepole of Mr. Barry's kitchen roof.' Anne turned pale, but there was clearly only one thing to be done. She walked towards the house, where a ladder was leaning against the kitchen roof. All the fifth-class girls said, oh! partly in excitement, partly in dismay. "'Don't you do it, Anne!' entreated Diana. You'll fall off and be killed. Never mind, Josie Pye. It isn't a fair dare to anybody to do anything so dangerous. I must do it. My honor is at stake, said Anne solemnly. I shall walk that ridgepole, Diana, or perish in the attempt. If I am killed, you are to have my pearl bead ring. Anne climbed the ladder amid breathless silence, gained the ridgepole, balanced herself uprightly on that precarious footing, and started to walk along it, dizzily conscious that she was uncomfortably high up in the world, and that walking ridgepoles was not a thing in which your imagination helped you out much. Nevertheless, she managed to take several steps before the catastrophe came. Then she swayed, lost her balance, stumbled, staggered, and fell sliding down over the sun-baked roof and crashing off it through the tangle of Virginia creeper beneath, all before the dismayed circle below could give a simultaneous terrified shriek. If Anne had tumbled off the roof on the side up which she had ascended, Diana would probably have fallen heir to the pearl bead ring then and there. Fortunately, she fell on the other side, where the roof extended down over the porch so nearly to the ground that a fall therefrom was a much less serious thing. 
Nevertheless, when Diane and the other girls had rushed frantically around the house, except Ruby Gillis, who remained as if rooted to the ground and went into hysterics, they found Anne lying all white and limp among the wreck and ruin of the Virginia Creeper. "'Anne, are you killed?' shrieked Diana, throwing herself on her knees beside her friend. "'Oh, Anne, dear Anne, speak just one word to me, and now tell me if you're killed!' To the immense relief of all the girls, and especially of Josie Pye, who, in spite of lack of imagination, had been seized with horrible visions of a future branded as the girl who was the cause of Anne Shirley's early and tragic death, Anne sat dizzily up and answered uncertainly, "'No, Diana, I am not killed, but I think I am rendered unconscious.'" "'Where?' sobbed Carrie Sloan. Oh, where, Anne? Before Anne could answer, Mrs. Barry appeared on the scene. At sight of her, Anne tried to scramble to her feet, but sank back again with a sharp little cry of pain. What's the matter? Where have you hurt yourself? demanded Mrs. Barry. My ankle, gasped Anne. Oh, Diana, please find your father and ask him to take me home. I know I can never walk there, and I'm sure I couldn't hop so far on one foot when Jane couldn't even hop around the garden. Marilla was out in the orchard picking a pan full of summer apples when she saw Mr. Barry coming over the log bridge and up the slope, with Mrs. Barry beside him and a whole procession of little girls trailing after him. In his arms he carried Anne, whose head lay limply against his shoulder. At that moment Marilla had a revelation. In the sudden stab of fear that pierced her to her very heart, she realized what Anne had come to mean to her. She would have admitted that she liked Anne, nay, that she was very fond of Anne, but now she knew as she hurried wildly down the slope that Anne was dearer to her than anything on earth. Mr. Barry, what has happened to her? she gasped, more white and shaken than the self-contained sensible Marilla had been for many years. Anne herself answered, lifting her head. Don't be very frightened, Marilla. I was walking the ridge pole and I fell off. I expect to have a sprain I have sprained my ankle, but Marilla, I might have broken my neck. Let us look on the bright side of things. I might have known that you'd go and do something of the sort when I let you go to that party, said Marilla, sharp and shrewish in her very relief. Bring her in here, Mr. Barry, and lay her on the sofa. Mercy me, the child has gone and fainted. It was quite true. Overcome by the pain of her injury, Anne had one more of her wishes granted to her. She had fainted dead away. Matthew hastily summoned from the harvest field was straightway dispatched for the doctor, who in due time came to discover that the injury was more serious than they had supposed. Anne's ankle was broken. That night, when Marilla went up to the east gable where a white-faced girl was lying, a plaintive voice greeted her from the bed. "'Aren't you very sorry for me, Marilla?' "'It was your own fault,' said Marilla, twitching down the blind and lighting a lamp. That is just why you should be sorry for me, said Anne, because the thought that it is all my own fault is what makes it so hard. If I could blame it on anybody, I would feel so much better. But what would you have done, Marilla, if you had been dared to walk a ridgepole? I'd have stayed on good firm ground and let them dare away. Such absurdity, said Marilla. Anne sighed. But you have such a strength of mind, Marilla. I haven't. I just felt that I couldn't bear Josie Pye's scorn. She would have crowed over me all my life, and I think I have been punished so much that you needn't be very cross with me, Marilla. Not a bit nice to faint, after all, and the doctor hurt me dreadfully when he was setting my ankle. I won't be able to go around for six or seven weeks, and I'll miss the new lady teacher. She won't be new any more by the time I'm able to go to school, and Gil, everybody will get ahead of me in class. Oh, I am an afflicted mortal." but I'll try to bear it all bravely if you only won't be cross with me, Marilla. There, there, I'm not cross, said Marilla. You are an unlucky child, there's no doubt about that. But as you say, you'll have the suffering of it. Here now, try and eat some supper. Isn't it fortunate I've got such an imagination, said Anne? It will help me through splendidly, I expect. What do people who haven't any imagination do when they break their bones, do you suppose, Marilla? Anne had good reason to bless her imagination many a time, and oft during the tedious seven weeks that followed. But she was not solely dependent on it, 
She had many visitors, and not a day passed without one or more of the schoolgirls dropping in to bring her flowers and books and tell her all the happenings in the juvenile world of Avonlea. "'Everybody has been so good and kind, Marilla,' sighed Anne happily, on the day when she could first limp across the floor. "'It isn't very pleasant to be laid up, but there is a bright side to it, Marilla. You find out how many friends you have. Why, even Superintendent Bell came to see me, and he's really a very fine man. Not a kindred spirit, of course, but still I like him, and I'm awfully sorry I ever criticized his prayers. I believe now he really does mean them, only he has got into the habit of saying them as if he didn't. He couldn't get over that if he'd... He could get over that if he'd take a little trouble. I gave him a good broad hint. I told him how hard I tried to make my own little private prayers, prayers interesting. He told me all about the time he broke his ankle when he was a boy. It does seem so strange to think of Superintendent Bell ever being a boy. Even my imagination has its limits, for I can't imagine that. When I try to imagine him as a boy, I see him with gray whiskers and spectacles, just as he looks in Sunday school, only small. Now it's so easy to imagine Mrs. Allen as a little girl. Mrs. Allen has been to see me fourteen times. Isn't that something to be proud of, Marilla, when a minister's wife has so many claims on her time? She is such a cheerful person to have visit you, too. She never tells you it's your own fault, and she hopes you'll be a better girl on account of it. Mrs. Lynde always told me that when she came Mrs. Lynde always told me that when she came to see me, and she said in a and she said it in a kind of way that made me feel she might hope I'd be a better girl, but didn't really believe I would. Even Josie Pye came to see me. I received her as politely as I could, because I think she was very sorry she dared me to walk a ridgepole. If I had been killed, she would have had to carry a dark burden of remorse all of her life. Diane has been a faithful friend. She's been over every day to cheer my lonely pillow. But, oh, I shall be so glad when I can go to school, for I've heard such exciting things about the new teacher. The girls all think she is perfectly sweet. Diana says she has the loveliest fair curly hair and such fascinating eyes. She dresses beautifully, and her sleeves, and her sleeve puffs are bigger than anybody else's in Avonlea. Every other Friday afternoon she has recitations, and everybody has to say a piece or take part in a dialogue. Oh, it's just glorious to think of it. Josie Pye says she hates it, but that is just because Josie has so little imagination. Diana Ruby Gillis and Jane Andrews are preparing a dialogue called A Morning Visit for next Friday. In the Friday afternoons, they don't have recitations. Miss Stacy takes them all to the woods for a field day, and they study ferns and flowers and birds, and they have physical culture exercises every morning and evening. Mrs. Lynde says she never heard of such goings on, and it all comes of having a lady teacher. But I think it must be splendid, and I believe I shall find Miss Stacy as a kindred spirit. There's one thing plain to be seen, Anne, said Marilla, and that is that your fall off the berry roof hasn't injured your tongue at all. Chapter 24 Miss Stacy and Her Pupils Get Up a Concert It was October again when Anne was ready to go back to school. A glorious October, all red and gold, with mellow mornings when the valleys were filled with delicate mists, as if the spirit of autumn had poured them in for the sun to drain. Amethyst, pearl, silver, rose, and smoke blue. The dews were so heavy that the fields glistened like cloth of silver, and there were such heaps of rustling leaves in the hollows of many-stemmed woods to run crisply through. The birch path was a canopy of yellow, and the ferns were sear and brown all along it. There was a tang in the very air that inspired the hearts of small maidens tripping, unlike snails, swiftly and willingly to school. And it was jolly to be back again at the little brown desk beside Diana, with Ruby Gillis nodding across the aisle, and Carrie Sloane sending up notes, and Julia Bell passing a chew of gum down from the back seat. Anne drew a long breath of happiness as she sharpened her pencil and arranged her picture cards in her desk. Life was certainly very interesting. In the new teacher she found another true and helpful friend. Miss Stacy was a bright, sympathetic young woman with the happy gift of winning and holding the affections of her pupils, bringing out the best that was in them mentally and morally. Anne expanded like a flower under this wholesome influence and carried home to the admiring Matthew and the critical Marilla glowing accounts of schoolwork and aims. 
I love Miss Stacy with my whole heart, Marilla. She is so ladylike and she has such a sweet voice. When she pronounces my name, I feel instinctively that she's spelling it with an E. We had recitations this afternoon. I just wish you could have been there to hear me recite Mary, Queen of Scots. I just put my whole soul into it. Ruby Gillis told me coming home that the way I said the line, Now, for my father's arm, she said my woman's heart farewell, just made her blood run cold. Oh, wait. Now from my father's arm, she said, my woman's heart farewell. Just made her blood run cold. Well, now, you might recite it for me some of these. Oh, wait. Well, now, you might recite it for me some of these days out in the barn, suggested Matthew. Of course I will, said Anne meditatively. But I won't be able to do it so well, I know. It won't be so exciting as it is when you have a whole school full before you hanging breathlessly on your words. I know I won't be able to make your blood run cold. Mrs. Lynn says it made her blood run cold to see the boys climbing to the very tops of those big trees on Bells Hill after crow's nests last Friday, said Marilla. I wonder at Miss Stacy for encouraging it. But we wanted a crow's nest for nature study, explained Anne. That was on our field a afternoon. Field afternoons are splendid, Marilla, and Miss Stacy explains everything so beautifully. We have to write compositions on our field afternoons, and I write the best ones. It is very vain of you to say so. You'd better let your teacher say it. But she did say it, Marilla, and indeed I'm not vain about it. How can I be when I'm such a dunce at geometry, though I'm really beginning to see through it a little, too? Miss Stacy makes it so clear. Still, I'll never be good at it, and I assure you it is a humbling reflection. But I love writing compositions. Mostly Miss Stacy lets us choose our own subjects, but next week we are to write a composition on some remarkable person. It's hard to choose among so many remarkable, pe remarkable people who have lived. Mustn't it be splendid to be remarkable and have compositions written about you after you're dead? Oh, I would dearly love to be remarkable. I think when I grow up, I'll be a trained nurse and go with the Red Crosses to the ba field of battle as a messenger of mercy. That is if I don't go out as a foreign missionary. That would be very romantic. But one would have to be very good to be a missionary, and that would be a stumbling block. We have physical culture exercises every day, too. They make you graceful and promote digestion. Promote fiddlesticks, said Marilla, who honestly thought it was all nonsense. But all the field afternoons and recitation Fridays and physical culture contortions paled before a project which Miss Stacy brought forward in November. This was that the scholars of Avonlea should get up a concert and hold it in the hall on Christmas night, for the laudable purpose of helping to pay for a schoolhouse flag. The pupils, one and all, taken graciously to this plan, the preparations for a program were begun at once, and of all the excited performers elect, None was so excited as Anne Shirley, who threw herself into the undertaking heart and soul, hampered as she was by Marilla's disapproval. Marilla thought it all rank foolishness. It's just filling your heads up with nonsense and taking time that ought to be put on your lessons, she grumbled. I don't approve of children's getting up concerts and racing about to practices. It makes them vain and forward and fond of gabbing. Of gadding. But think of the worthy object, pleaded Anne. A flag will cultivate a spirit of patriotism, Marilla. Fudge! There's precious little patriotism in the thoughts of any of you. All you want is a good time. Well, when you can combine patriotism and fun, isn't it all right? Of course it's real nice to be getting up a concert. We're going to have six choruses. Diane is to sing a solo. I'm in two dialogues. The Society for the Suppression of Gossip and the Fairy Queen. The boys are going to have a dialogue, too, and I'm to have two recitations, Marilla. I just tremble when I think of it, but it's a nice, thrilly kind of tremble, and we're to have a tableau at last. Faith, hope, and charity. Diana and Ruby and I are to be in it, all draped in white with flowing hair. I'm to be hope, with my hands clasped. So, and my eyes uplifted, 
I'm going to practice my recitations in the garret. Don't be alarmed if you hear me groaning. I had to groan heartrendingly in one of them, and it's really hard to get up a good artistic groan, Marilla. Josie Pye is sulky because she didn't get the part she wanted in the dialogue. She wanted to be the fairy queen. That would have been ridiculous, for whoever heard of a fairy queen as fat as Josie? Fairy queens must be slender. Jane Andrews is to be the queen, and I am to be one of her maids of honor. Josie says she thinks a red-haired fairy is just as ridiculous as a fat one, but I do not let myself mind what Josie says. I am to have a wreath of white roses on my hair, and Ruby Gillis is going to lend me her slippers because I haven't any of my own. It's necessary for fairies to have slippers, you know. You couldn't imagine a fairy wearing boots, could you? Especially with copper toes. We are going to decorate the hall with creeping spruce and fur mottoes, with pink tissue paper roses in them, and we are all to march in two by two after the audience is seated while Emma White plays a march on the organ. Oh, Marilla, I know you are not so enthusiastic about it as I am, but don't you hope your little Anne will distinguish her herself? All I hope is that you'll behave yourself. I'll be heartily glad when all this fuss is over and you'll be able to settle down. You are simply good for nothing just now with your head stuffed full of dialogues and groans and tableaus. As for your tongue, it's a marvel it's not clean worn out. Anne sighed and betook herself to the back yard, over which a young new moon was shining through the leafless poplar boughs from an apple-green western sky, and where Matthew was splitting wood. Anne perched herself on a block and talked the concert over with him, sure of an appreciative and sympathetic listener in this instance, at least. Well, now, I reckon it's going to be a pretty good concert, and I expect you'll do your part fine, he said, smiling down into her eager, vivacious little face, and smiled back at him. Those two were the best of friends, and Matthew thanked his stars many a time, and oft that he had nothing to do with bringing her up. That was Marilla's exclusive duty. If it had been his, he would have been worried over frequent conflicts between inclination and said duty. As it was, he was free to spoil Anne, Marilla's phrasing, as much as he liked, but it was not such a bad arrangement after all. A little appreciation sometimes does quite as much good as all the conscientious bringing up in the world. Chapter 25 Matthew Insists on Puffed Sleeves Matthew was having a bad ten minutes of it. He had come into the kitchen in the twilight of a cold gray December evening and had sat down in the wood box corner to take off his heavy boots, unconscious of the fact that Anne and a bevy of her schoolmates were having a practice of the Fairy Queen in the sitting room. Presently they came trooping through the hall and out into the kitchen, laughing and chattering gaily. They did not see Matthew, who shrank bashfully back into the shadows beyond the wood box with the boot in one hand and a boot jack in the other and he watched them shyly for the aforesaid ten minutes as they put on caps and jackets and talked about the dialogue and the concert. Anne stood among them, bright-eyed and animated as they, but Matthew suddenly became conscious that there was something about her different from her mates, and what worried Matthew was that the difference impressed him as being something that should not exist. Anne had a brighter face and bigger starrier eyes and more delicate features than the others, even shy, unobservant Matthew had learned to take note of these things, but the difference that disturbed him did not consist in any of these respects. Then in what did it consist? Matthew was haunted by this question long after the girls had gone arm in arm down the long, hard-frozen lane, and Anne had betaken herself to her books. He could not refer to, to Marilla, who he felt would be quite sure to sniff scornfully and remark the only difference she saw between Anne and the other girls was that they sometimes kept their tongues quiet while Anne never did. This, Matthew felt, would be no great help. He had recourse to his pipe that evening to help him study it out, much to Marilla's disgust. After two hours of smoking and hard reflection, Matthew arrived at a solution of his problem. Anne was not dressed like the other girls. The more Matthew thought about the matter, the more he was convinced that Anne never had been dressed like the other girls never since she had come to Green Gables. Marilla kept her clothed in plain dark dresses, all made after the same unvarying pattern. If Matthew knew there was such a thing as fashion in dress, it is as much as he did. 
but he was quite sure that Anne's sleeves did not look at all like the sleeves the other little girls wore. He recalled the cluster of little girls he had seen around her that evening, all gay in waists of red and blue and pink and white, and he wondered why Marilla always kept her so plainly and soberly gowned. Of course, it must be all right. Marilla knew best, and Marilla was bringing her up. Probably some wise and scrutable motive was to be served thereby. But Shirley would do no harm to let the child have one pretty dress, something like Diana Barry always wore. Matthew decided that he would give her one. That Shirley could not be objected to as an unwarranted putting in of his oar. Christmas was only a fortnight off. A nice new dress would be the very thing for a present. Matthew, with a sigh of satisfaction, put away his pipe and went to bed, while Marilla opened all the doors and aired the house. The very next evening, Matthew betook himself to Carmody to buy the dress, determined to get the worst over and have it done with. It would be, he felt assured, no trifling ordeal. There were some things Matthew could buy and prove himself no mean bargainer. But he knew he would be at the mercy of the shopkeepers when it came to buying a girl's dress. After much cogitation, Matthew resolved to go to Samuel Lawson's store instead of William Blair's, to be sure the Cuthberts always had gone to William Blair's. It was almost as much a matter of conscience with them as to attend the Presbyterian Church and vote conservative, but William Blair's two daughters frequently waited on customers there and Matthew held them in absolute dread. He could contrive to deal with them when he knew exactly what he wanted and could point it out, but in such a matter as this, requiring explanation and consultation, Matthew felt that he must be sure of a man behind the counter. So he would go to Lawson's, where Samuel or his son would wait on him. Alas, Matthew did not know that Samuel, in the recent expansion of his business, had set up a lady clerk also. She was a niece of his wife's and a very dashing young person, indeed, with a huge drooping pompadour, big rolling brown eyes, and a most extensive and bewildering smile. She was dressed with exceeding smartness and wore several bangle bracelets that glittered and rattled and tinkled with every movement of her hands. Matthew was covered with confusion at finding her there at all, and those bangles completely wrecked his wits at one fell swoop. "'What can I do for you this evening, Mr. Cuthbert?' Miss Lucilla Harris inquired, briskly and gratiatingly, tapping the counter with both hands. Have you any, 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 well, now say, any garden rakes? stammered Matthew. Miss Harris looked somewhat surprised, as well she might, to hear a man inquiring for garden rakes in the middle of December. I believe we have one or two left over, she said, but they're upstairs in the lumber room. I'll go and see. During her absence, Matthew collected his scattered senses for another effort. When Miss Harris returned with a rake and cheerfully inquired, Anything else tonight, Mr. Cuthbert? Matthew took his courage in both hands and replied, Well, now, since you suggest it, I might as well take, that is, look at, buy, buy some, some hayseed. Miss Harris had heard Matthew Cuthbert called odd. She now concluded that he was entirely crazy. "'We only keep hayseed in the spring,' she explained loftily. "'We've none on hand just now.' "'Oh, certainly. Certainly. Just, just as you say,' stammered unhappy Matthew, seizing the rake and making for the door. At the threshold, he recollected that he had not paid for it, and he turned miserably back. While Miss Harris was counting out his change, he rallied his powers for a final desperate attempt. Well, now, if it isn't too much trouble, I might as well, that is, I'd like to look at, at some sugar. White or brown? queried Miss Harris patiently. Oh, well, now, brown, said Matthew feebly. There's a barrel of it over there said Miss Harris, shaking her bangles at it. It's the only kind we have. I'll, I'll take twenty pounds of it, said Matthew, with beads of perspiration standing on his forehead. Matthew had driven halfway home before he was his own man again. It had been a gruesome experience, but it served him right, he thought, for committing the heresy of going to a strange store. 
When he reached home, he hid the rake in the tool house, but the sugar he carried into Marilla. Brown sugar, screamed Marilla. Whatever possessed you to get so much? You know I never use it except for the hired man's porridge or black fruit cake. Jerry's gone, and I've made my cake long ago. It's not good sugar either. It's coarse and dark. William Blair doesn't usually keep sugar like that. I, I thought it might come in handy sometime, said Matthew, making good his escape. When Matthew came to think the matter over, he decided that a woman was required to cope with the situation. Marilla was out of the question. Matthew felt sure she would throw cold water on his project at once. Remained only Mrs. Lynde, for of no other woman in Avonlea would Matthew have dared to ask advice. To Mrs. Lynde he went accordingly, and that good lady promptly took the matter out of the harassed man's hand. Pick a nice dress for you to give Anne, to be sure I will. I'm going to Carmody tomorrow, and I'll attend to it. Have you something particular in mind? No? Well, I'll just go by my own judgment, then. I believe a nice rich brown would just suit Anne, and William Blair has some new glory in that's real pretty. Perhaps you'd like me to make it up for her, too, seeing that if Marilla was to make it, Anne would probably get wind of it before the time and spoil the surprise. Well, I'll do it. No, it isn't a mite of trouble. I like sewing. I'll make it fit. I'll make it to fit my niece, Jenny Gillis, for she and Anne are as, are as like as two peas as far as figure goes. Well, now, I'm much obliged, said Matthew, and, and I don't know, but... I'd like, I think, to make the sleeves different nowadays to what they used to be. If if it wouldn't be asking too much, I, I like them made in the new way. Puffs? Of course. You needn't worry a speck more about it, Matthew. I'll make it up in the very latest fashion, said Mrs. Lynde. To herself, she added, when Matthew had gone, It'll be a real satisfaction to see that poor child wearing something decent for once. The way Marilla dresses her is positively ridiculous, that's what, and I've ached to tell her so plainly a dozen times. I've held my tongue, though, for I can see Marilla doesn't want advice, and she thinks she knows more about bringing children up than I do, for all she's an old maid. But that's always the way. Folks that has brought up children know that there's no hard and fast method in the world that'll suit every child. But them as never have think it's all as plain and easy as rule of three. Just set your three terms down so fashion, and the sum will work out correct. But flesh and blood don't come under the head of arithmetic, and that's where Marilla Cuthbert makes her mistake. I suppose she's trying to cultivate a spirit of humili humility in Anne by dressing her as she does, but it's more likely to cultivate envy and discontent. I'm sure the child must feel the difference between her clothes and the other girls, but to think of Matthew taking notice of it. That man is waking up after being asleep for over sixty years. Marilla knew all the following fortnight that Matthew had something on his mind, but what it was she could not guess until Christmas Eve, when Mrs. Lynde brought up the new dress. Marilla behaved pretty well on the whole, although it is very likely she distrusted Mrs. Lynde's diplomatic explanation that she had made the dress because Matthew was afraid Anne would find out about it too soon if Marilla made it. So this is what Matthew had been looking for so mysteriously over and grinning about to himself for two weeks, is it? She said a little stiffly but tolerantly. I knew he was up to some foolishness. Well, I must say, I don't think Anne needed any more dresses. I made her three good, warm, serviceable ones this fall, and anything more is sheer extravagance. There's enough material in those sleeves alone to make a waist. I declare there is. You'll just pamper Anne's vanity, Matthew, and she's as vain as a peacock now. Well, I hope she'll be satisfied at last, for I know she's been hankering after these silly sleeves ever since they came in, though she never said a word after the first. The puffs have been getting bigger and more ridiculous right along. They're as big as balloons now. Next year, anybody who wears them will have to go through the door sideways. Christmas morning broke on a beautiful white world. It had been a very mild December, and people had looked forward to a green Christmas. But just enough snow fell softly in the night to transfigure Avonlea. Anne peeped out from her frosted gable window with delighted eyes. The firs in the haunted wood were all feathery and wonderful. The birches and wild cherry trees were outlined in pearl, the ploughed fields were stretched of snowy dimples, and there was a crisp tang in the air that was glorious. Anne ran downstairs singing until her voice re-echoed through Green Gables. Merry Christmas, Marilla! Merry Christmas, Matthew! Isn't it a lovely Christmas? I'm so glad it's white. 
any other kind of Christmas doesn't seem real, does it? I don't like green Christmases. They're not green. They're just nasty faded browns and grays. What makes people call them green? Why? Why? Matthew! Is that for me? Oh, Matthew! Matthew had sheepishly unfolded the dress from its paper swathings and held it out with a de deprecatory glance at Marilla, who feigned to be contemptuously filling the teapot, but nevertheless watched the scene out of the corner of her eye with a rather interested air. Anne took the dress and looked at it in reverent silence. Oh, how pretty it was! Lovely soft brown Gloria, with all the gloss of silk, a skirt with dainty frills and shirrings, a waist elaborately pin-tucked in the most fashionable way, with a little ruffle of filmy lace at the neck. But the sleeves, they were the crowning glory. Long elbow cuffs, and above them two beautiful puffs, divided by rows of shirring and bows of brown silk ribbon. That's a Christmas present for ye, Anne, said Matthew shyly. Why, why, Anne, don't you like it? Well, now, well, now, for Anne's eyes had suddenly filled with tears. Like it? Oh, Matthew! Anne laid the dress over a chair and clasped her hands. Matthew, it's perfectly exquisite. Oh, I can never thank you enough. Look at those sleeves. Oh, it seems to me this must be a happy dream. Well, well, well. Let us have breakfast, interrupted Marilla. I must say, Anne, I don't think you needed the dress, but since Matthew has got it for you, see that you take good care of it. There's a hair ribbon Mrs. Lynde left for you. It's brown to match the dress. Come now, sit in. I don't see how I'm going to eat breakfast, said Anne rapturous, at rapturous, rapturously. Breakfast seems so commonplace at such an exciting moment. I'd rather feast my eyes on that dress. I'm so glad that puff sleeves are still fashionable. It did seem to me that I'd never get over it if they went out before I had a dress with them. I'd never have felt quite satisfied, you see. It was lovely of Mrs. Lynde to give me the ribbon, too. I feel that I ought to be a very good girl, indeed. It's at times like this I'm sorry I'm not a model little girl, and I always resolve that I will be in the future. Somehow it's hard to carry out your resolutions when irresistible temptations come. Still, I really will make an extra effort after this. When the commonplace breakfast was over, Diana appeared, crossing the white log bridge in the hollow, a gay little figure in her crimson ulster. Anne flew down the slope to meet her. Merry Christmas, Diana! And oh, it's a wonderful Christmas! I've something splendid to show you! Matthew has given me the loveliest dress with such sleeves! I couldn't even imagine any nicer. I've got something more for you, said Diana breathlessly. Here, this box. Aunt Josephine sent us out a big box with ever so many things in it. This is for you. I'd have brought it over last night, but it didn't come until after dark, and I never feel very comfortable coming through the haunted wood in the dark now. Anne opened the box and peeped in. First, a card with, For the Anne Girl and Merry Christmas written on it, and then a pair of the daintiest little kid slippers with beaded toes and satin bows and glistening buckles. Oh, said Anne, Diana, this is too much. I must be dreaming. I call it providential, said Diana. You won't have to buy our ruby slippers now. That's a blessing, for they're two sizes too big for you, and it would be awful to hear a fairy shuffling. Josie Pye would be delighted, mind you. Rob Wright went home with Gertie Pye from the practice night before last. Do you ever hear anything equal to that? All the Avonlea scholars were in a fever of excitement that day, for the hall had to be decorated and a last grand rehearsal held. The concert came off in the evening and was a pronounced success. The little hall was crowded. All the performers did it excellently well, but Anne was the bright particular scar of the occasion, as even envy in the shape of Josie Pye dared not deny. "'Oh, hasn't it been a brilliant evening?' sighed Anne, when it was all over and she and Diana were walking home together under a dark starry sky. 
everything went off very well, said Diana practically. I guess we must have made as much as ten dollars. Mind you, Mr. Allen is going to send an account of it to the Charlottetown papers. Oh, Diana, will we really see our names in print? It makes me thrill to think of it. Your solo was perfectly elegant, Diana. I felt prouder than you did when it was in, when it was encored. I just said to myself, "It is my dear bosom friend who is so honored." Your recitations just brought down the house, Anne. That sad one was simply splendid. Oh, I was so nervous, Diana, when Mr. Allen called out my name. I really cannot tell how I ever got up on the platform. I felt as if a million eyes were looking at me and through me. For one dreadful moment, I was sure I couldn't begin at all. Then I thought of my lovely puffed sleeves and took courage. I knew that I must live up to those sleeves, Diana. So I started in, and my voice seemed to be coming from ever so far away. I just felt like a parrot. It's providential that I practiced those recitations so often up in the garret, or I'd never been able to get through. Did I groan all right? You did indeed. You groaned lovely, assured Diana. I saw old Mrs. Sloan wiping away tea. wiping away tears when I sat down. It was splendid to think I had touched somebody's heart. It's so romantic to take part in a concert, isn't it? Oh, it's been a very memorable occasion indeed. Wasn't the boys' dialogue fine? said Diana. Gilbert Blythe was just splendid, Anne. I do think it's awful mean the way you treat Gil. Wait till I tell you. When you ran off the platform after the fairy dialogue, one of your roses fell out of your hair. I saw Gil pick it up and put it in his breast pocket. There now. You're so romantic that I'm sure you ought to be pleased at that. It's nothing to me what that person does, said Anne loftily. I simply never waste a thought on him, Diana. That night, Marilla and Matthew, who had been out to a concert for the first time in twenty years, sat for a while by the kitchen fire after Anne had gone to bed. Well, now, I guess our Anne did as well as any of them, said, Ma Anne, said Matthew proudly. Yes, she did, admitted Marilla. She's a bright child, Matthew, and she looked real nice, too. I've been kind of opposed to this concert scheme, but I suppose there's no real harm in it after all. Anyhow, I was proud of Anne tonight, although I'm not going to tell her so. Well, now, I was proud of her, and I did tell her so before she went upstairs, said Matthew. We must see what we can do for her some of these days, Marilla. I guess she'll need something more than Avonlea school by and by. There's time enough to think of that, said Marilla. She's only thirteen in March, though tonight it struck me she was growing quite a big girl. Mrs. Lynn made that dress a mite too long, and it makes Anne look so tall. She's quick to learn, and I guess that be I guess the best thing we can do for her would be to send her to Queen's after a spell. But nothing need to be said about that for a year or two yet. Well, now... It'll do no harm to be thinking it over off and on, said Matthew. Things like that are all the better for the lots for thinking over. All right. That is all the reading for tonight. We will get back to Anne um, next time I read. And then Saturday I will be reading from, I think I was going to do the Clockwork Sparrow, the beginning of that. But thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the story, and I will.